<clears throat> this is the last Sunday in the liturgical year, and it's referred to as the Feast of Christ the King. I think Father Martin invited me to preach today because he knows I'm a devoted fan of the Netflix monumental series, The Crown, now in its fifth glorious season. How many of you watched The Crown? A few of you, okay. Well, I'll fill you in a little bit here. It's all about the life of Queen Elizabeth and her calling as queen to protect and preserve the monarchy in England at all costs. This series is not a documentary, but it is, as they say, based on known facts. However, much of the dialogue and the plot line is totally fabricated. It's a popular show, and it's interesting to me that our nation fought the Revolutionary War precisely to rid ourselves of living under a monarch. Yet, when that war was over, there was a serious movement to proclaim George Washington as our nation's king. Fortunately, he liked the idea put forth in the Constitution and chose to become our president. That said, to this day, many of us in this country have a fascination with the English monarchy. Maybe it's because of the fairy tales that we hear as children. The glamour, the glory, the castles, the power, the opulent coaches, the guns, the romantic grand balls. But the truth is, and it comes out in the crown, it's that the queen and all other monarchs are really about preserving, maintaining, and holding on to as tightly as they possibly can the mystique of their exalted positions. I'm grateful that Queen Elizabeth died. I'm not really grateful, I mean, but she was, what was she, 97? It's 96, because I, I, who knows if she watched this, this kind of a show, but it's, a, it's a, this season particularly is a, a little grim in terms of Queen Elizabeth, so I'm glad she didn't live to, to see it. And it remains to be seen whether or not King Charles III, who surely has had the longest monarchical internship in history, We'll have to see if he's able to hold on to the kingly office and his jeweled crowns. Okay, so here we are today to acknowledge Jesus as King of King and Lord of Lords. As we heard in this morning's gospel, people then, as now, did not grasp what it meant to call Jesus a king. Meanings are not always clear. I'm reminded of the man who was driving a refrigerated truck full of 25 penguins to the zoo. Martin knows this story. Unfortunately, just outside of town, the truck broke down. And the delivery man was frantic. He had these 25 penguins. And it was a warm day, and the penguins really needed to get to the zoo. The delivery man flagged down a farmer who was driving a large truck and said, I will give you $800 to take these penguins to the zoo. Well, that sounded like a good idea to uh, the farmer, so he happily agreed. The penguins were loaded into the farmer's truck and off they went. In the meantime, the delivery man was able to find a mechanic to repair his refrigerated truck and three hours had to pass, and so he thought, well, I'll go check on those penguins before heading home. As he drove through town, he was amazed to see the farmer and all 25 penguins in line waiting to get into the matinee at the local movie theater. The delivery man jumped out of his truck and approached the farmer, and he says, what on earth are you doing here? I told you to take these penguins to the zoo. The man replied, well, I did take them to the zoo, 
and we had such a good time, and since I had all this money left over, we decided to go to the movies. Hearing the words doesn't guarantee comprehending their meaning. And this is true whether we're communicating instructions to a delivery man taking penguins to the zoo, or understanding what we mean when we recognize Jesus as King of Kings. In today's gospel lesson, we heard more talk of Jesus as a king. But the account reveals in the gospel someone who dies the death of a victim, someone who's taunted on a cross between two criminals. In looking at this picture of the Son of Man, the Son of God, the one we've referred to as Lord of Lords, the one who is the very definition of love without blemish or self-interest, the one who dies with the words of forgiveness on his lips, as we consider all this, this is not a demonstration of kingly power as we normally think of it. I'm not sure she really said this, but it's claimed that on reflection of this scene, St. Teresa of Avila grumbled, God, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. By whatever measure, Jesus looked and acted like no king we would recognize. He was not a king with a jeweled crown or fancy robes. His was a crown of thorns. To understand and appreciate the meaning of Christ the King, we need a whole lot of sophistication much more than the Sunday school student who'd been hearing the stories about how magnificent the kings and queens of the Old Testament were. As the Sunday school teacher waxed on about these kings and queens, the teacher then asked, now you know there is a higher power, can anybody tell me what it is? And one very precocious card-playing child responded, aces. When we look at the cross, we do not see someone who aced the powers and principalities of this world. We see someone who is totally against hierarchical tyrannies, someone who lived servanthood over domination or individual supremacy, someone who died without a penny to his name, someone who ruled over no nation, Someone who said, my kingdom is not of this world. So why do we proclaim Jesus as king of kings? Well, certainly there are Old Testament uh, readings. We heard one this morning from Jeremiah where this notion of kingship and messiahship is brought out. But instead, it turns out that Jesus is the epitome of not of kingship as we would normally think of it, but he is the king of sacrificial love, a love that gave its all for us, his beloved. Jesus is the king of compassion. He doesn't fit the ordinary mold of kingship. Yet his presence and the power of his example of perfect love is a call to each of us to join his community of self-giving love, which is a kingdom that turns the whole notion of kingship and indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> of, of being part of a kingdom upside down. Other monarchs have come and gone, but Jesus remains and endures the test of centuries. Unlike worldly monarchs who are given their subjects, we as followers of Jesus choose to commit ourselves to him and to the standards of his kingdom. We do that 
one day and one person at a time. Once we have said yes to Jesus, we then spend our lives following the one we know to be the way, the truth, and the life. On this feast day of Christ the King, we're again reminded that God has given us a clear message in Jesus. Jesus' throne was not a golden chair, but instead was a wooden cross. Christ challenges us to look for a truth and reality that is eternal and never fades away. Jesus calls us by the power of his humble example and compassion and forgiveness. He calls us into a community of sisters and brothers who embody and live these values. Grace Memorial is an outpost of Christ's kingdom. You have chosen to follow the one who is the most humble king this world has ever seen. Daily, the choice of being a member of this band of sisters and brothers is up to you. <clears throat> this is the choice that will mean in practical terms consequences in terms of how you live out your life every single day. Soon, Grace Memorial will be talking more about one aspect of being a follower of Christ, and that has to do with your participation uh, in the life of this community and how you support that community through your giving. You'll be hearing more about that in the weeks ahead, but I urge you to consider carefully and prayerfully how you, as a member of Christ's kingdom, can give your very best to living out your life within the context of this community. Being a Christian and following Christ means living in a fullness that I think uh, I found nicely described in a poem that was evidently written on the wall of Mother Teresa's home for children in Calcutta. It reads, people are unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of being selfish and having ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. But give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It never was between you and others anyway. These are pretty much the rules, I think, by which King Jesus lived his life. As citizens of Christ's kingdom, they are helpful reminders to each of us as the way we are to live our lives. As we now move into the season of Advent next Sunday, may each of us claim our allegiance to the one who is now and will always be our true king now and forever. Amen.